Introducing the mass, you could leave these fermions. So why isn't it the case that all the fermions live with the same, by the, by the same amount? Yeah, I mean, you have to be careful what terms you're introducing the atom. Um, but, but you can lift just the doubles. So it's not that you give the same mass to all the fermions. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's a little bit of a 
yeah, you, you get a additive mass shift basically on, on the double modes. In, in, in contrast, in some sense, what we're going to be talking about now, you can think of as being more and more applicative. Modification to the universe having a proper data rather than the other shift. Okay. So, Ginsburg and Wilson basically noted that you can get Carl symmetry back in the continuum if you have a modified Carl symmetry relation of some finite lattice space. This was the intuitions were based on RG blocking. We have some RG transformation onto a blocked lattice, but we're just going to take the take the equation here as given. So. <coughs> So we have a symmetry under this transformation. Try pushing the exponential through the D. Yeah, let's let's commute these guys, right? Now the commutator 
of this D with the Diane exponent here, I can just do that by plugging in the Gibbs Buck Wilson relation. So from the from the Gibbs Buck Wilson relation, this is sort of an aside. We know that D gamma five one minus over to D plus over to D. Zero. Okay. I just wrote down the commutator of D with this term. But if you expand it out, we have D gamma 5 plus gamma 5 D, and then other terms are what we're on the right hand side here. Okay. And sorry, this lets me just flip that through. I pick up the sign and I bring the gamma 5 on the other side of this experiment. Pretty clear that the symmetry of the action because those two exponentials just cancel each other off. Okay, so this is sort of nice. Uh, we need to do a few more things. We need to think about what curl projectors would look like if this is our curl symmetry relation. We need to think about what our projected fields would look like if this is our curl symmetry relation. But once we have all those pieces, this is okay, but then we need to figure out how do we actually write it down the D that satisfies that. All right, that's sort of where the work is. But first, let's just finish the thought and look at what we'll get a little like here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, D here, it doesn't contain the math curve, right? No, D is just D slash. Okay. Okay, so if there is math curve there, and then there is no curve energy. Yeah, right. The master still explicitly breaks power symmetry. That's what we want, though. Yeah, we just want the same power symmetry in the last one. So, um, projectors, right? They look a little bit funny because they're these Ds floating around, but we can still write them down. Push the change into what I'm doing now by that so the projectors look almost like they're not really doing. Um, you can check that these are actually projectors. What do they need to satisfy from the projectors? Some theory. Squared to one. Some theory. Yeah, some theory identity square to one. Right? No, square to itself. Huh? Square to itself. Square to itself, yeah. Square to itself, some theory identity. Uh, orthogonal. Yeah, so we can check. Um, check. Okay. Um, we want to define what our projected fields look like. And this gets a little funny also. We're going to write down this is just a check. Um, we keep that R. The hats are always my modified projectors. We can see is actually PLD, where this is our normal projector. No hats is normal projectors, hats are modified projectors. And this is again to plug in and check this, but I want to use this in a moment. P R and L R one plus my S. So my usual projectors. 
and with these we can define our right-handed field will look like, which is our right-handed projector, and our left-handed field, and our left-handed projector acting on the field. But the barn fields on the inverse, right? The barn fields look slightly funny. With the normal projectors acting. So the point of all of that is really to define what we mean by these projected fields in this new sense. And now we can check that this all works out exactly how we want it to. Right? We want cyber D sine. What do we want that to look like in terms of projectors? I want to expand it in psi L and psi R's. So, yeah, it would look like a sum with an L bit and an R bit, right? And if we use these definitions, it all works out nicely. So, with the bar, we put the left and right projectors in the same ones. On the right, for the non bar, we put the added guys. And we just use these relations here when we expand. <coughs> and now we can simplify this. This will have some size hanging around. Just looks like the sum of the two terms <laughs> with our two projected fields. Okay, uh, you can also write down what a natural mass term would be. Well, what does the continuum mass term look like in terms of projected fields? Yeah, exactly. You get the psi bar, r, psi l, and then offset pieces. You can write down the same thing. Yeah, it all works the same way with these projected fields. Um, you do get that the chiral transformation is like slightly non-local as the pinch bracket with this nearest neighbors. Um, but you can you can show that the fermion propagator actually only violates chirality locally, so everything works out pretty nicely. So this is a nice definition. The problem is then actually constructing D's that satisfy it in a sort of practical way. And so that's where we're going to spend the rest of the time before we talk about state of the art light changes. Explicit constructions of D to satisfy this relation. So, because yeah. I understand the algebra, but the reason why you need these hat projectors uh, is because you want to satisfy that condition. That's right. And the main difference is that they introduce this lattice space independence that goes away when you take A to C. That's right. Exactly. But we now just have these. A times D terms period everywhere. Here in this gamma phi term, which is these modified projectors, they're in the Carl symmetry relation. We've got these A times D's appearing everywhere. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So in the gamma phi hat, you have one minus A D, but in the chiral transformation upstairs, you have one minus A over T, A over uh, two over times D. Yeah, that's right. So the factor of two is it on purpose? Yeah, the factor of two is on that. It's just to work that there are different projectors. Yeah, yeah it's just to make this part here work out. Yeah. And that you don't need to factor it in there. So you have not defined D yet. I have not defined D. And, and that's part of the problem. You know, this this one, this story is going to be worse than the time. And then you write the difference. And then. What's the transformation of the measure? The transformation of <coughs> measure that mm -hmm. mm. transform the measure. But it's supposed to not remain in many ones. It's a it's a axial transformation. Mm. 
these transformations up here, these modified Karl transformations. So you mean the measure of my action integral, which is dx, you know, I've got dx? Yeah. No. The uh, uh, measure of the path integral. Oh, the measure of the path integral. Um. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You have to be a bit careful about that. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right. You have to be a little careful there. Um, let's talk about that after more. Yeah. Do you, you have a question? Yeah, you, you want to get the right continuum on it. That's the, that's the point. Okay. Um, so now we want to figure out how you can actually write down a D that works for this. So okay, one option is the overlap operator. This was actually introduced slightly later than the next one we'll talk about, which is domain wall fermions, um, but it's, it's sort of prettier and shorter to talk about um, from Neuberger. We, we can we can discuss later yeah um okay so overlap operator is nice it explicitly satisfies the ginsburg wilson relation okay and the o's here is not an index it's for overlap okay so the overlap d looks like this and like a few things in this lecture, this is sort of not obvious just to stare at, right? This took some work to come up with. Um, I'm gonna define it and then talk about it. Okay, so this is a definition of a Dirac operator that will satisfy this. Yeah. That's the sine function. Yeah. It's a matrix valued function. Yeah. It's just yeah. so th this is this is just a definition. We have a gamma five, we have this matrix valued sine function. We have to be a little bit careful. H is gamma five times A, and I haven't told you what A is, it's just some gamma five Hermitian kernel doesn't matter too much what it is. Um, a typical choice would be to construct this kernel from a Dirac operator that we already have, like the Wilson Dirac operator or, or similar, right? So then you sort of bootstrap from the other Dirac operators you already have up, up, up to here. But if you can define something like this, um, then you can be in business. We're, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this. The numerical problem is that this sign can be pretty tricky to a, evaluate and then things get a little nasty numerically. Okay, um, a, another way of writing this and we'll check that it satisfies the ginsburg wilson relation. Another way of writing this is like this if we like. Right, this is well defined because this H squared just looks like A dagger A. Um, so th th these are the same thing. Okay, we can check it satisfies Ginsburg Wilson. So I'm just going to plug the D naught in here. So, so this, this, this looks like the um, right hand side 
of the Ginsburg-Wilson relation here with an extra gamma five on the end, All right? And I'm just gonna work backwards and get the left-hand side with an extra gamma five on the end. So that, that's just this guy. And I'm just gonna plug in these D noughts here and expand out. So we're just plugging and chugging to check that it satisfies our relation. Okay, the, the order of the gamma five and the sign don't really matter, but because it's matrix valued, I feel weird swapping them. So that's, that's not really significant there. Um, okay, we can just expand this out, right? H squared, uh, H squared there is just A dagger A, right? Yeah, a, a, H squared just simplifies down to, to A dagger times A, right? Um, it would be, where did I define H? There, so, H squared would be gamma five, A, gamma five, A, just looks like A, so just a matrix multiplication out. Okay, um, this term has a much simpler expression. Yeah, this is just one, right? So I can just write this more simply. Right, so this guy here just became that one there. And now this looks like exactly what I want it to look like. This looks like D naught gamma five squared plus gamma five D naught gamma five is gamma five D naught with an extra, oops, gamma five on the end, which is exactly the left-hand side of the ginsburg wilson with an extra gamma five on the other side. Right, so this construction explicitly satisfies this. Um, again, it sort of looks non-local um, because we have you know, h squared to the minus a half. And so it's, and, and h is like d, so it's sort of nearest neighbor, but then d to the minus a half couples everything, right? But um, it's in fact local enough that for sufficiently smooth fields, you can bound d zero. So that's one construction. It's not obvious. Um, it's numerically non-trivial because the sine function needs to be approximated really carefully. But 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 this is one way of, of having a sort of good approximate chiral symmetry when you want to write down a fermion discretization. Okay. From something like a Wilson D to to this D, yeah, it can be as as much as a factor of five or even an order of magnitude, depending what you're trying to do. Um, it, it can be it can be significant. Yeah, it, it sort of depends because also the statistics look a little different. A here. This is just some gamma five Hermitian kernel. Uh, a, a typical choice would be to build it out of uh, the, the Wilson Dirac operator. So build it out of another Dirac operator. So that would look like, um, what would that look like? 
look like exactly? It would look something like, Like, I don't have it in my notes, but I think it's about this. An extra A on like an, an, a, a different Dirac operator, like the Wilson Dirac operator, and then there's some, this is like a plus or minus, some shift term. So it's just something you've constructed to be gamified permission. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is an explicit construction for this, this lattice operator. This is one example. Yeah, there, there's others. I'm gonna talk about one more, um, which is domain wall fermions. So the domain wall fermions came a little earlier. So these are due to Kaplan. And so these are not quite the same. These approximately satisfy the Ginsburg-Wilson relation, and then they satisfy it in a particular limit. These are a little uglier, but I think it's good to at least have an idea of what people mean when they talk about domain wall fermions. Um, Okay, so approximately satisfy in Spark Wilson, they satisfy exactly in a limit. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the fundamental idea and the continuum. Um, we might not have time to go through all the details of putting it on the lattice, but most of the interesting parts you can see in the continuum already. So let's start with the continuum. And we're gonna start with a free fermion in 5D Euclidean space time. So we now are in 5D space, so we need an extra coordinate, which we're gonna call S. So S here is gonna be my coordinate in my fifth dimension. We can write down a Dirac equation in five dimensions. If you're wanting sort of intuition, we'll talk more about this later, but why suddenly we're talking about 5D, or you don't have Carl symmetry in odd numbers of spatial dimensions, so it's sort of convenient to go up an extra dimension. Okay, so we can write down a Dirac equation. Okay. What would a Dirac equation look like with an extra dimension kicking around? I can write down the usual 40 bit, right? I can write down a gamma mu d mu piece, but what else? Yeah, I need a gamma five and a ds piece, right? I need the same thing, but for the extra dimension. And I'm going to add in some mass. And this mass, I'm going to generalize a little bit and make it actually dependent on my fifth dimension. Right? So I'm, I'm allowing it to be a bit more general. And I'm going to take a specific option here. Um, this is only one choice. You can also have smoother choices, but this will do for us. Okay. 
we'll see why this is useful in a moment. Um, you, you can smoothly interpolate between them rather than having this, this sharp transition. But the important point is that I want this to be plus m as s becomes large and minus m as s goes to negative infinity. Right. Um, if, if you're looking carefully, we're breaking Poincare symmetry in 5D, um, also parity, but, but not in 4D. And so although we're moving to five dimensions, in the end, we're gonna project everything back onto the four dimensional space time we're actually interested in. So that's, that's not a problem. Okay, so we have a Dirac equation. And let's see what this gives us and write out the solutions. Okay, so I'm, I'm postulating here a solution form. These guys here, this is just, uh, depends on X. So it's my 4D coordinate, right? Then my fifth coordinate is sitting here in these extra functions, B and F, where I've just pulled out the left and right handed pieces of my 4D function here, right? And given them different 5D coordinates. Oh, yeah, good, thanks. Yep. Good. Okay. Um, let's set a Dirac equation also for the 4D piece. All right. So let's take all right, just a 4D Dirac equation on the, these pieces of the solution. And then we can plug, I'm gonna do it on the big board, but we can plug these in up there and see what it implies and write down the solutions to this, to this 5D Dirac equation. The mu ends, yeah, so we're gonna see what mu ends there are solutions for. We're gonna be particularly interested in solutions where mu n equals zero if they exist. All right, so let's plug in. This is just that equation on the middle left-hand board, right? And I'm now plugging in this solution. Okay, um, that first term, the gamma mu d mu term, I'm gonna use this and write that as mu's, right? So that first term I'm gonna write as, as, as mu's here. That's why I have a minus mu n. And then the next term, we've got the d by ds derivative, right? Which is gonna hit just these guys. So I'm gonna write b n prime for the derivative. The projectors are changing here because this is just the, the gamma five with the projector that I'm simplifying down. Then we've got the mass.
Okay. I'm going to simplify this by collecting everything with a PL and collecting everything with a PR, right? So I'm going to be able to see left-handed and right-handed pieces to look for left and right-handed solutions. So let's pull everything with a PL to the left. Okay, and now we can see that we have two equations here, one for the left-hand mode and one for the right-hand mode that we can write down. We have d by ds plus m times bn is mu fn for the right-hand mode, and we have minus d by ds plus m n is mu n for the left-hand mode. Okay, so we've only got one scale, we've got m, right? So sort of canonically, we're gonna expect the mu's to be much bigger than m, and there's an, there's an infinite tower of solutions there that we're not interested in right now. We're interested in solutions for mu n equals zero, the massless solutions of our, of our 40 graph equations there. Do these have solutions for mu n equals zero? They both have solutions for mu n equals zero? Only one of them, right? There's a solution to the first equation, but not the second equation, we'll write it down. Okay, so Okay, solution to the first equation with mu n equals zero. We can just write it down. What's it look like? Yeah, it looks like an exponential, right? So some normalization. Right, because we set our big mass function just to be a, a step function, right, either at plus m or minus m. So this just looks like an exponential, but there's no corresponding solution to the other equation because either the plus m s is not normalizable, right? So we just have a single right-handed massless mode. Um, it's localized around this defect at s equals zero that we have. But the defect at s equals zero, you can think about the discontinuity in M, right? We have this big, big jump there. Um, you can see that by thinking gamma mu, d mu. So this is 
nice, right? We have a nice construction. We had to introduce a fifth dimension. But at the moment, we have an infinite fifth dimension, and we're in the continuum. So the pieces we still have to worry about is we have to go from an infinite fifth dimension to a finite fifth dimension, and then we have to discretize. Probably won't have time to go through the discretizing in detail. The infinite to finite part is sort of interesting, and we, we can talk about that a little bit. Um, so thinking about a finite fifth dimension, we're just gonna take some finite slab from minus S to S. Um, we're gonna end up with not just a single mode anymore, we're gonna end up with another one sort of at the, at, the, at the boundary. But then as you take the limit of your fifth dimension becoming infinitely large, they'll decouple. And so that's the limit in which we get back the satisfying. Um, our ginsburg wilson relation. So then numerically, you have to do a bunch of calculations with different size fifth dimensions and take the limit as that becomes large. So not only do you have a whole extra dimension to deal with, but you have to take another limit, which makes this expensive. Okay, so this required infinite fifth dimension. Consider a finite slab. So we're going to take from minus S naught, some value of S naught to S naught and periodic boundary conditions. And so by that, I mean, I'm going to take, I'm going to shift the fifth dimension by 2s0. I'm going to get back to where I started. All right, so we're just periodic in this finite fifth dimension. Okay. So what this looks like is, um, what I'm going to write down is what I sort of just said before is that you end up with both left and right handed solutions. Um, they, they are peaked around S naught is equal to zero and S naught is equal to plus minus, uh, S is equal to zero and around S is equal to plus minus S naught. And as you make the dimension um, bigger, they, they get further and further apart and decouple and they decouple exponentially quickly. So it's not that bad. Okay, so. Okay, we're gonna write our mass, which is S dependent like this for now. And we have a kink at S equals naught. And also at S is equal to S naught with the opposite discontinuity. You get both left and right handed solutions. draw a picture in a second. Okay, this is just writing down solutions just like we had before, but now we have two. And if we want to draw what that sort of looks like, we'll have, this will be B naught here. We also have over here at S naught and minus S naught, we have a we have a similar peak at that boundary for F naught for our other solution, right? So we still have our um, right-handed one, but we also have a left-handed one. Okay, so away from the free field limit, the two modes couple and, and, and you get a mass. Um, but, but like I said, that, that vanishes exponentially quickly as you take 
the size of your fifth dimension to be larger. You, you get copies of you, you have your four dimensional gauge field and you have copies for each S. Yeah. So for each for each fifth dimension point, you have a copy of all of your four dimensional gauge fields. Right. Ah, oh, did I just write on this board? I did, didn't I? Sorry. So um, there's a nice connection between the domain wall and the overlap, which was the other solution we just talked about. So if we look at the Green's functions of the 5D Dirac equation we have, we're going to find the overlap operator um, drops out. So if I want to write down the Green's function for the 5D Dirac equation for a right-handed mode, I'm going to write down d5 g and then what's another way of writing this huh delta function yeah exactly so let me just write out d5 explicitly but gamma mu d plus gamma 5 d5 plus m G is equal to a delta function, right? That's what we mean by the Green's function. We just have to have the delta function in our four dimensional theory and also in our fifth dimension. And I want a, um, I want this to be for a right-handed mode. Okay, so I'm gonna say right-handed projector on our Green's function is equal to zero. Now you can write down a solution for this. Again, not obvious by I, but, but we can write it down. So this was solved by, this solution was by, by derived by Lucia. By this, you can plug and check. Um, where this D is exactly the 4D overlap operator from the other approach to constructing a D that has some, some car symmetry that we talked about before. So Okay. So, we have now a finite fifth dimension. We've seen we get back an extra mode, but the, and the, the, they couple and create a mass, but that the mass goes away exponentially as you make that fifth dimension larger. So we still have a good limit in which we get our chiral symmetry um, back. Now I need to think about putting it on a lattice. And so the key thing is we have to discretize um, the fifth dimension. Yeah. 
I'll steal. Yeah, yeah, you, you can choose other S's. Do that. Uh, so we always have to set the S1 values to some initial value. Uh, uh, writing down S dependent solution would be pretty ugly. Um, I if there exists an S dependent solution or, or what it looks like. Asking, can you do that? Yeah, you can yeah. choose other values of S. Yeah. Um, actually, so, so discretize, discretize last thing. So we want to discretize onto a 5D lattice. Okay. So before we called our lattice lambda, now we'll call it lambda cross an extra z where we have whatever the number of sites are in our fifth dimension, so some fixed number. Since there was a question about what happens to gauge links, I'll actually write it out explicitly, I think. So the domain wall fermion action is gonna look like the sum over our spatial, our normal four dimensional spatial sites in Lambda. We're gonna have a sum over the S's. Which both which, which range up to the length of our fifth dimension. Where the domain wall fermion guy here in the middle. has delta functions in the S's, has a normal four dimensional, here I'm writing DW for D Wilson, but a four dimensional Dirac operator with the mass MS. And then we have a five, a fifth dimension part, which is um, the domain wall part. I'm going to write this down in a moment. This is 4D, any of the other constructions we talked about yesterday. This is the interesting part. And it's constructed from gauge links that are living in 4D and are then replicated for each S in the, in the fifth dimension. So last bit of ugliness, so this DW is our 4D Wilson operator, the D, um, which like I said, is constructed from gauge links in 4D replicated for each S. So this is, this might not sound like much, but in a moment when I tell you about scale of state of the art calculations, just the four dimensional piece can be as much as 300 gigabytes per sample. And if you need to replicate that for some large number of fifth dimension sites, you're talking about terabytes for a single gauge field configuration. So this gets, this is sort of a big deal that, that your gauge fields get a lot bigger. Um, and D5 is just a bunch of delta functions, basically. With our projectors.
Okay. Um, you see an M appearing here. The, that turned out to be the, the light fermion mass. And there are these one minus delta terms here. Those, um, they basically block hopping to the boundary sites if that, that light fermion mass there is equal to zero. That's what those terms are doing. Uh, this thing, this fifth dimension thing is totally independent of the gauge field. So the gauge fields are just living here, in, replicated living here in this normal four dimensional Dirac operator piece. Okay, so with this, this, this guy, but with that filled in for that D5, um, for the mass equals zero, we have the spectrum with just a, a right-handed fermion near the S equals zero boundary. We have a left-handed fermion near the, near the other boundary, the, the wrapping around boundary. You have a tower of massive states that span across the whole fifth dimension with large masses. We don't want them. Um, so what you can actually do is you can introduce additional Pauli Villars fields to cancel off that tower of massive states that you don't want. And then you're just left with, with the modes that you actually actually want. And you get the four dimensional field back just by projecting out from the five dimensional fields. And similarly, you get your four dimensional correlation functions just by pulling out the right piece of the five dimensional correlation functions. Okay, I think that's, that's about it for domain wall fermions. I mean, so they're approximately chirally symmetric for that M there is equal to zero. Um, but because you have the overlap of the left and right-handed modes sitting at these boundaries, you get an extra like residual mass term, but that goes away exponentially fast as you, you move those modes further apart by, by making your fifth dimension larger. Um, so because it vanishes exponentially fast, the fifth dimension doesn't need to be that big in, in practice. Yeah, yeah. Can you me here? No, we, we um, oh wait, do you mean are we viol we're not violating the theorem? No. I mean, we, we, we don't have chiral symmetry at a discrete lattice spacing. We just have it in the limit that we care about. Okay. Yes. Anyone else? No, because after that, I got a little bit. Uh, I forgot about the motivation. So you introduce this fifth dimension oh. as, as another way to violate the assumptions of the theorem. Is that right? Yeah, essentially, as, as, as another way of constructing a fermion operator that satisfies the Ginzburg Wilson relation, which is this sort of modified version of chiral symmetry at finite lattice spacing that gives me back the actual chiral symmetry that I want in the continuum limit. Yeah, that, that they're both sort of expensive. It, it depends um, exactly what observables you're trying to compute, how much you really care about chiral symmetry, what about the other symmetries of your theory. It, bo both are used in production calculations. Um, so is the Wilson um, Dirac operator, which gives up on chiral symmetry entirely. So it really depends on the problem. Yeah, okay. So there's also other chiral fermion dispersations that we didn't get to talk about that approximately satisfy the Ginzburg-Wilson relation. They're called things like perfect or fixed point fermions, if you want to Google them. There's also um, chirally improved fermions. That's where you basically expand the general action in, in paths and then you tune the coefficient so that you, you get back approximately the, the Ginzburg-Wilson relation to whatever order you've, you've done your expansion to. So there's a lot of a lot of options for solutions, but you've got to figure out what the right one is for the problem you're trying to solve. Okay, let me quickly change topics for a moment. So I don't know if I said um, or if Mike said, but we're in this really exciting time of real precision calculations for lattice QCD for you know. Hadron structure, spectroscopy for sort of simpler things. And we're also in an exciting time for the very beginnings of being able to do real nuclear physics calculations. That's something I spend a lot of time on is 
calculating nuclear reactions from lattice QCD, things like this. And we've started to get proof of principle results even for that. Um, so state of the art is for QCD is really phenomenally large scale. So for like a, a simple theory, especially if you have gauge fields, you might be able to do a, a really nice calculation on your laptop or a few nodes at a local cluster for calculations of mu on G minus two that are trying to get you know, real precision on the hadronic pieces. You might need um, millions or hundreds of millions of core hours and a five or 10 year campaign on the biggest supercomputers. So it's really like an experiment where you're collecting data for a decade. So, so some typical scales, and this is now for QCD, is that the lattice spacing in physical units these days is something like 0.04 to 0.12 Fermi. And like I said, on the first day, you have to do a range of calculation to different lattice spacings and take the continuum limit. 0.04 is usually pretty good. That's about where our algorithms start to break down and you get topological freezing in your sampling. So pushing beyond this is really, really hard. Um, you, so, but for most quantities, you can construct an action where the continuum limit, it has fairly mild effects once you get down to these, these lattice spacings. The lattice volume, so this would be L cubed by T if you're doing domain wall fermions, there's an extra dimension on here also. Um, this will span from something like this is sort of borderline of something you'd use in a production calculation, 24 sites in each spatial dimension and 48 in the temporal direction to pretty routinely used in some of the bigger calculations are more like 128 cubed by 256. That might not sound that large, but if we think about what that means is we have, of course, 128 cubed by 256, but, but where do the degrees of freedom live on these lattice samples? on the links, right? And what do the links look like? What sort of structures? Matrices, SE3 matrices, right? So we've got this many links, that many sites times a link in each of the four directions at each site, times NC squared, times real and imaginary parts, right? So this looks like four times 10 to the 10, which looks like, 320 gigabytes. That's for one of these gauge fields. Um, then you need some number of configurations, which will be like maybe a thousand to a hundred thousand of those. Um, and, and if you think about it, that, that number should sound really small to you, right? We're talking about something with like 10 to 10 degrees of freedom a probability distribution with 10 to the 10 degrees of freedom. And I'm telling you that a thousand or 10,000 samples is enough to get a good sampling of it. It's because it has a really peaky structure that we know very well, but it's sort of amazing this works. Um, number of measurements is somewhere between, let's say a thousand to a hundred thousand, because you might take advantage of translation invariance and put multiple measurements on it, different parts, different decorrelated parts of a single configuration to increase your statistics. Um, so that would mean, uh, this would mean, you know, hundreds of thousands of inversions of Dirac matrices that are really big sparse matrices of order lattice volumes um, squared, right? So first you have to generate these things, then you have to invert Dirac matrices on them. Uh, quark masses. Calculations are being done at physical quark masses, but also at heavier than physical quark masses. Um, sometimes even lighter than the physical mass because interpolating is nicer than extrapolating. But calculations get more expensive as you get lighter. So especially for things that are you know new, trying to push the boundaries of, of what's possible, you might make them heavier to start and then extrapolate down to save a bit on computational cost. Um, number of flavors, of course you need to, Choose. You might have zero, two, 
2 plus 1, 3, 2 plus 1 plus 1, 2 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. So, so by this I would mean two light quarks that are mass degenerate. So U and D, this would be U and D and then a strange quark with a different mass. You might have three degenerate quarks be an SU3 point, or you might have them all be different. You might have one plus one plus one. So these are choices that you make when you're setting the bare parameters of the calculation. A lot of the high precision calculations these days are two plus one plus one or two plus one plus one plus one. The isospin breaking corrections are still pretty small compared to some of the others. So not many calculations break the UND degeneracy, but, but some do. Um, No, this is three dynamical quarks, but two that have the same mass and one that has a different mass. So that would be mass degenerate U and D quarks and then a strange quark. Yeah, that's what that's what they mean. That's right. Yeah. Um, and then computing resources. So from something like a few million core hours to some small calculations to state of the art would be multi-year, hundreds of million core hours. And of course, um, running on all the hardware that it, you know, GPUs, even tensor processing units. Um, these sorts of calculations take about 10% of open science that's sort of public supercomputing in the US every year. So um, really pushing the boundaries of what's possible means trying to exploit all the hardware that's possible. State of the art calculations also um, are starting to use QCD plus QED. So do both in the same framework dynamically, which is nice because of course, um, QED changes the quark masses, which change the QCD piece. So they're all tangled up, but of course QED is not asymptotically free and doesn't have a continuum limit. So it's really should be thought of as an effective theory um, that, that you're doing in that case. Okay, cool. Um, there's also a whole bunch of community libraries. This is the last thing I wanna write down. If anyone wants to, to play, a lot of them are well documented and there's even a nice uh, Python library for playing around with simple theories. So it's no longer the case that to do a lattice QCD calculation, you need to merely, you know, deeply invest in learning a, a code base. There's a bunch of more accessible options available these days. So so there's things like milk, chroma, grid and GPT, which in this case stands for grid Python toolkit. Um, Clua, which is Lua based and very intuitive, open QCD and, and, and others, but they're all sort of packages you can download and, and play with. And there's also CUDA inverters that work with all of them for running on GPUs. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I do want the four dimensional part to look like my normal four dimensional theory. So I'm going to project everything back at the end. So I, I, I do need to keep that slab separate from the four dimensional piece. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you want AD to, to go to zero. The formula looks strange. Is it still on the board? It's not on the board anymore, right? Oh, um, right. There was a one over A at the front, and then I had this thing that I called H, which depend on kernel A. That kernel A is also going to have another A in it. Yeah, you need to write the 
Yeah, I, I didn't. So, so the kernel will look something like something time like a times the Wilson Dirac operator plus some. Um, you see, it's rubbed off now. But I, I yeah, you want a good limit as you take a to zero. Yeah, um, some of them, so a lot of them you could just do say SU2 or SU3 adjoint, less likely to be built in by default. You're more likely to have to write some of your own backend pieces. Um, yeah, that's, and then especially even if it exists, it's probably not well optimized. Um, so some limited flexibility changing the theory, most optimizations for QCD or close to QCD. 